give people a little time to come in. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, there's only two people here today. Giving folks a minute to come in. I'm in a different environment today. Uh, I was just, um, uh, I, I'm in the Facebook office. Hello, hello, welcome. Yeah, we we fully reopened uh, Monday this week. I could have walked over to the NYU campus, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't know where to go. All right, so it's 4.56, so let's go ahead and get started. So hi, everyone. Um, Thanks for uh, 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 letting me do a pre-recorded lecture on Monday. I didn't get anyone at the Monday office hours. I don't know if that was because the lecture was perfectly clear or, um, you know, uh, uh, no, everyone decided to go watch it later. But um, that's okay, because we're going to move on today and start talking about control flow, um, which will be a very important topic because um, the next thing we're going to do to our uh, metacircle interpreters, which I don't know if you started working on your homework or not, um, but that's that's what's going to be due next week. And then after that, we're going to generalize it to be written in continuation passing style. So how does that work? You know, how is it all put together? Well, that's what today's lecture is going to be all about. Um, so there's going to be a few parts of this lecture. So the first is going to be a little bit of fluff about like. Um, the bad old days when people didn't know that like GoTo was bad and they just did whatever they wanted and the shift um, to what we call structured programming where we don't allow arbitrary control flow but there is some structure. There are certain control flow constructs that structure how um, our programs evolve and those are the ones that people tend to use. And that'll encapsulate a lot of simple control flow abstractions, but there is one particular abstraction that is super important and people use a lot, and that's what we call procedural abstraction, AKA the stack, right? It's the ability to call functions and then return from them. And what is very interesting about procedural abstraction is for most control flow constructs, uh, like if statements, while loops, you know where you can go. When you return from a function, you don't know where you're going to go. It depends on dynamic data. And we'll take that to its logical extreme when we talk about continuations, which are basically a generalization of this concept of, you know, you don't know where you're going to go. Uh, it's represented by some data to let you represent arbitrary um, uh, possible futures that don't have to follow the stack structure. So parts one and two of this lecture should be pretty familiar. Maybe you'll get something new from them. Um, I think continuations will be very interesting and the chunky new part of this lecture. All right, so let's talk about the bad old days. So back in the day, the way that people wrote programs was they would write things like this, right? Where um, you know they had a bunch of uh, uh, lines of code. They actually had put literal line numbers, and um, there were some conditions. And uh, you know uh, you would say, well, if something is true, then go to this line number, and that's literally how these programs would evolve. Um, and uh, that's how people wrote their code for a very long time because you know that was basically the best they could do. Um, with uh, the compiler technology at the time. And Dijkstra wrote this very influential essay uh, called A Case Against the Go-To Statement, where basically he said that, hey, um, you know, go-to statements are bad. Um, and why are they bad? They're bad because um, they're very, very low level. They would correspond to what your, you know, machine executing your code knows how to do, um, but uh, they don't tell you anything about what the high-level structure of the program is. And so um, this essay basically gave the idea that, hey, you know, um, when you are in a higher-level programming language that gives you higher-level constructs for doing control flow, you really shouldn't use goto in those situations. Of course, um, you know, that didn't stop Donald Knuth from writing a counterpoint essay where he was like, hey, um, I know Dijkstra said that goto is bad, 
but actually go to is pretty cool and sometimes it has some pretty uh, useful applications. And so his, his essay, Structured Programming with Go-To Statements, um, these are all linked from the syllabus, by the way. So if you want to go take a look at these, these are like classic papers. So um, you can read them and like understand a little bit of where the history um, for the programming language design came from. But this essay, Nuth is like, hey, you know, I know like if statements and loops are cool, but sometimes there are things that I want to do that I just cannot conveniently do with the existing control flow constructs that are ubiquitous in programming languages. And here are a few examples where um, go-to statements make my logic cleaner, make it easier to deal with. And uh, what, what we'll find is, you know, in the third part of this lecture, when I talk about continuations, that's going to be all about a, basically a form of structured go-to, like that works in higher order languages. And there's been a lot of research about like how exactly to go about doing this, because it's, it's not obvious. It took, it took decades to figure it out. Yeah, so Nuth is like, hey, go-to uh, is bad most of the time, but sometimes there are use cases where it is pretty useful. Um, so, like, so what is this thing that uh, you know Dijkstra and Nuth are talking about? They're just talking about this concept of structured programming, and uh, really, all I'm referring to here is just you know the control flow constructs that we know and love, uh, namely, uh, you know, if then else, while do, um, for statements, that sort of thing. So instead of having a sort of unmanageable nest of like go-to statements where any particular line in your code can go to any other line in your code because that's what go-to's allow you to do. Structured programming give you like this very structured, um, you always do the same thing uh, when you are going through. So there's, there's a pattern and the, the control flow construct encodes this pattern for the execution of your program. By the way, can anyone tell me what, what this control flow diagram me is so the blue lines means control can flow to so I'll flow to some block and then either I'll go to the left block or the right block and then eventually they'll come back together yes if if statements here's another one any guesses what this one is it's kind of funny looking yeah so this is switch statements and uh, when you have the bit where uh, uh, you know, this box goes to the next box, that's fall through, which is implemented in most uh, languages that support switch statements. Um, here's another one. Yeah, while loops. Um, there's a condition, and if it's true, you do the statement and then test the condition again. Here's another one, a little more complicated, also kind of loopy. I see someone suggesting do while. Uh, there, I, I put a bunch of blocks, extra blocks in the inside of the function though. Yeah, it's for loops. So we have a loop initialization, a loop uh, test condition, and then we uh, run the body. Uh, at, I don't remember when we do the increment. Oh, you do the increment at the end of the loop, and then and then you test the condition again. So so hey, you know y'all y'all know all this. So, so that's all I really want to say about like basic control flow, right? So, so we're, we're going from you know unstructured control flow to structured control flow, and um, we can talk about where code may flow. So what's so different about the stack? What is so different about the uh, fundamental data structure that lets us write functions, that lets us write procedures, and organize our programs in this way? And to see why uh, this is different, um, it's useful to think about an example. So here is an example where I have three functions. Um, I've got f, g, and h, and they do a bunch of stuff. And in particular, f and g call h, and then after h returns, they do some extra computation. So let's try writing a block diagram with the blue control flows to in the same way we did before. So we said that f calls h and g calls h, so I can have arrows from f to h, um, and that seems pretty normal. Um, but when I am running h, and I'm done running h, and I return from h, I don't necessarily know which function I'm going to call next. I can call f, and uh, that would be, sorry, sorry, no, I don't want to say call. I could return to f, 
which would be correct if you know h had been called from the context of f. But I can also return to g. And all of the um, structured uh, loops that we looked at before, those all were uh, situations where all I had to do was sort of look locally at what I was executing to find out what I should do next, right? So like we had an if statement, the if statement said run some code, and then if it's true, go left, if it's false, go right. But with here, when h returns, um, there's no local computation that tells me where I need to go next. Um, I actually need some extra data, right? And that extra data is the stack. By the way, um, the idea that like you can't tell where you're going to go after you return from h, this has uh, this has like security implications because one of the things that uh, people want to do when they are like analyzing programs is they want to know uh, you know given some piece of code uh, where is the next um, piece of, uh, place in the program that it can possibly go. Why is this important? It's important because in unsafe languages, and also in safe languages sometimes too, um, uh, if someone exploits your program, the way that it typically works out in that situation is uh, they like write some you know, executable code somewhere in the program, and then they trick you into going off and executing it. And so a lot of security mechanisms, the idea behind them is, hey, I don't, this is bad, I don't want this to happen. Uh, like if I could somehow figure out where uh, any given function is supposed to go next, then if I notice it going to somewhere where I don't expect it to go from the original program, then hey, that is a problem and I should like, you know, say, okay, raise an error because uh, something very weird is going on. But functions make this very difficult to do, right? Because they could go anywhere. Um, if you do have your entire program, you can do an analysis to be like, well, here are all the possible call sites to this function, and I can only return to those places. There's a, actually a really interesting uh, uh, class of exploits called return-oriented programming. And the way that this works is that um, because, because where you return to is uh, controlled by data, it's controlled by the stack, what you can do is you just write a whole bunch of return addresses that point to random spots in your program. And what will happen is, okay, you return. That pushes you to where you, um, asked, uh, the, the, you asked the code to go, which is probably gonna be in the middle of some function somewhere because return pointers are just addresses. And then you execute the instruction and then you hit another return instruction and then that will bounce you to another location. And by just chaining these up, you can actually do arbitrary Turing complete computation simply by just having a bunch of return addresses on your stack. So that's return oriented programming. It works around the problem, which is that you, you weren't able to write like actual x86 uh, bytecode to some executable region in your heap. So instead you do it this way. It was crazy stuff, right? And it all comes down to the fact that um, this is dynamic control flow. It is control flow that depends on data in your program. So it's not a local decision. It depends on some actual data structure. So returns, return to the return pointer on the stack. By the way, exceptions, you know, exceptions are also a form of non-local control flow. When you throw an exception, you like sort of warp out of wherever you were and you go to some other place in your code. And those are also implemented using the stack, right? When you um, write a try catch block that pushes an exception handler to the stack <coughs> and it tells you where to go. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how exceptions work in more detail. Um, hopefully everyone here has used exceptions before, um, so this should be pretty familiar. I do want to talk about it because we're going to redo these ex examples with continuations later. So it's helpful to have like some basic uh, basic uh, ground rules about like what behavior we're actually looking at here. So here I have a program. It's very simple. I have a function f. It throws an exception, and then I have a try catch block where I uh, call that function inside the try catch block. So how does this actually execute? So, um, so we we talked a lot about um, the evaluation model. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this again. Uh, do this again. So we're going to be in a top level environment. Um, we have a function f defined. The f uh, is going to have a closure, which uh, whose environment pointer points to the top level environment, 
and whose body simply says, hey, throw an exception. Cool. When we do a try catch block, uh, we are going to register a, uh, a new scope um, called the, uh, the, 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 the handling block, which basically is going to say, hey, um, you know, this has some special, uh, we can think of it as a closure. They're not represented as closures internally, but it's, it's a pretty good approximation, which says what we're going to do if an error is thrown. And I'm using this black bar just to um, denote that we are actually, uh, we actually have a exception handling catch in the situation. And the access link points to the top level. Um, there's a nota being on this slide that try does not actually introduce scope for var, although it does introduce scope for let. So this, this diagram would be accurate if we were like doing let bindings in the situation. Okay, so we have this new stack frame, we've got this guy, and uh, I'm just gonna like, you know, uh, simplify this a little put show error here and here. And then finally, we do the call to F. And the call to F, uh, you know, we have to set up the access pointer to point to the same environment that our uh, closure saved as the environment. So we, we're going to skip the activation record frame. And uh, then we're going to also set the parameter to one. And then we're going to raise an exception. And when we, when we raise an exception, right, the semantics of exception handling is I'm going to walk backwards on the stack until I find the first exception handler, and that's the one I'm going to use to actually run the code. Uh, what are your questions so far? Hopefully this is pretty familiar. Okay, so I want to do a more complicated example because there's a very interesting analogy I want to I wanna, uh, show here. So in this more complicated example, I have a bunch of functions. Uh, I've got f, g, and g. f throws an exception. Uh, g uh, uh, is a function that takes in a function as an argument, h. Um, it opens a try-catch block and then calls that pass-in function with the argument 1. And I've peppered a bunch of try-catch blocks, so I, I then call g with f as its higher order argument. And I've peppered this program with a bunch of catch blocks. So there's a top level catch block, there's a catch block around the call to g, and there's a catch block around the call to h. Um, so question, uh, which catch block catches the thrown exception? I hear a three. Anyone else have any other guesses? Three? Three is right. Um, and let's just look real quickly why it is correct. So we start off with the top level. We install the exception handler for two. Then we define a bunch of functions. I've just omitted their implementations, but they're just exactly what you see here. Uh, we install another uh, exception handler, uh, try catch here. Um, it's one in this case. We call G, which allocates a new activation frame with H pointing to the uh, closure that we had here. Uh, and then we install the last try catch handler, 3. We call H, resulting in a new activation frame with Y equal to 1. And then we finally throw the exception, therefore getting to 3. OK, so the thing I want to point out here is um, that exceptions respect dynamic scope. So previously, we, um, we talked about how to, implement, uh, how to implement variable scoping, right? This is, this is last week. And we said, hey, when I want to figure out what variable I want to look up, I need to follow lexical scoping. And in particular, I need to look in the environment that the access link for my current environment says I should go to. So in this program, where I've literally just replaced the try catch blocks with let bindings, and I've replaced the uh, exception throw with a print, this E that will be printed here is 2. Because, well, when I look at the source code, this is obvious to see um, the E corresponds to like the one that is enclosing it and not these three and one. But when I raise an exception, I don't 
follow the lexical scoping. I don't go to the try catch block that was installed at the time I defined this function. I look at whatever my stack was at this point in time and I uh, try to do it. I, I, I go to the try catch block that's closest to me in that situation, right? I don't go to the lexically scoped try catch block. Now you might be wondering, hey, Ed, maybe it would be a useful thing for uh, these to support the other mode, right? Like what would it mean if I could um, turn on dynamic scoping for my variable lookups? And if you write in Emacs Lisp, um, in fact, all variables work like this by default. So like it's actually pretty useful because um, uh, the way that dynamic scoping for variables, um, what it turns out to encapsulate is an idiom where you are implicitly passing the arguments to your function in question. So to get dynamic scoping for this example, right? So previously I didn't pass E around, I just used lexical scoping to get the right one. To get dynamic scoping to print out three in this situation in the same way as uh, um, the same way as exceptions would have handled it, where the exception would have printed out three, would go, gone to the try cache block at the location of three. All I need to do is just pass e as an argument to all of these functions. So instead of you know looking it up in the scope, I will simply say whatever e was when f was called, that is what I'm going to print. And now we can see that we're going to print e be, uh, three because I bound uh, e to three, and then I called h with e as the argument here. Pausing a moment if people have questions. So then another question you might have is, okay, so try catch blocks, um, you know, look at the dynamic scope to figure out where to go. Is there a version of try catch blocks that are lexical? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Like, could we actually just jump all the way back to um, the try catch block that was in effect at the time F was defined? And the answer is yes. And that language construct is called continuations. So we've exited the realm of like, normal stuff, right? So we, we all know how stacks work because it's very hard to write programs. Um, and we know how exceptions work because like that's something you also learn uh, in your intro class. Um, and so now I want to turn the world upside down and talk about continuations. Any last questions about the previous material before we move on? Okay. So before I uh, get into the technical detail on continuations in earnest, I want to first motivate the concept behind continuations a bit because um, you know they they it's kind of a scary sounding name like oh continuations right and most languages don't offer built-in uh, capabilities for dealing with continuations so hey like um, it's not it's not that uh, it's not that um you may not notice that you're dealing with continuations. But actually, in a lot of programs you might be interested in writing, you do. So here's one example. So uh, uh, this is called um, quote unquote async programming. So the model here is um, in a lot of languages, especially JavaScript, um, we have this concept of a callback. What exactly is a callback? Well, we have a bunch of operations where we want to do something and it may take a while for that thing to actually happen, right? Like where, for example, we want to fetch a uh, fetch a page off the internet, and so like we're not going to wait until the page gets um, returned because there might be other stuff going on in my page, like the animation on my pointer that needs to get processed. So what I'll do is I'll say, hey, okay, start, you know, downloading that web page, and when you're done, call me back with the result so that I can do more stuff. And so this, uh, you end up getting these programs where, you know, like first I need to get this tag. So, okay, call me back when you get the tag. And then once I've got the tag, uh, once I've got the list of all the photos that, you know, have this tag, then uh, I wanna get a, uh, another, I wanna get a photo from this list. And once you actually give me 
the the uh, result of that, then I actually, you know, finally can do some sort of final operation on this result. And so when you write naive um, callback code, um, you often end up with the sort of uh, trying triangular indentation of doom, um, also known as callback hell, where you keep having to write more and more nested functions, uh, you know, to like express the thing. So wouldn't it be great if your language had support for like callbacks natively, and that many languages are adding this capability, and this is what we refer to as async programming. What I actually want to say here, though, is a little bit different. These callbacks, these things that say, hey, once you're done, call me back and do this next, these callbacks are continuations. So like, if you want to mentally you know, search replace continuation with callback, find by me, like we're talking about the same thing. They tell you what to do next, what the continuation of the current operation should be. All right, here's another example. Um, so uh, this one comes from your operating system. So in your operating system, uh, uh, you have a lot of different programs running out at the same time, right? You might have your music player going, you might be you know, browsing on the web, and you might also have you know, your uh, uh, editor in the background for you know, your programming language, right? And in the old days, right, there were your, your computer only had a single CPU in it. And, um, and so that CPU could only be executing one stream of instructions at any given point in time. And did that mean that you could only ever do one thing on these computers? No, your operating system uh, like, uh, it worked hard to give the illusion that actually multiple things were going at the, on at the same time. And how did they do that? Well, uh, they basically said, okay, I'm gonna run this thread for a bit, and then when uh, some you know, interval has elapsed, I'm gonna stop suspend the state of the thread and then go off and execute something else. And then later, when I decide that I wanna go back to this, I can take that suspended state and execute it again. Well, that suspension, that thing that says how to keep going with the thread in question, that is a continuation, right? It says what the execution of that thread might be in the future. Now your operating system implements multi-threading using you know, low-level uh, uh, instructions that are offered by your processor, like interrupts and like the fact that it controls the entirety of the register state and your you know, virtual memory mapping to represent the state of your thread. But in a language that is single-threaded, like JavaScript, you may still want to be able to multi-thread uh, in a situation, but just do it manually where you like save your state yourself and then like have it run later. And this is also like to do that, you would want to somehow reify the continuation in the situation. And in fact, later we are going to have a proper lecture on concurrency, and then you are going to implement cooperative multi threading in JavaScript, which you know natively doesn't support this. Uh, one more example. Um, so uh, in, um, in many programs, uh, we don't have a you know, sort of straight line execution of code. We have this external universe, like the user who's like moving their mouse around, clicking on your page, who wants to like basically trigger actions when those, uh, when those events happen. And so in GUI programs, um, it's very common to be like, hey, uh, you know, I want to wait for some event to happen, and then when it happens, I want to do something. And then maybe I want to sleep a bit and then do something else after some amount of time. Like, that would be like an alarm clock. And um, typically, right, you don't write the code that I've written on the left here where it's like this sequential, okay, wait for button, then do op then sleep, then do another op. You typically write it in a way that has callbacks. And once again, like, you know, all you're saying is after this event happens, what should happen next? And these are all continuations in the same way. Uh, I have one more example. So this is your debugger. So uh, you've probably used a debugger to help figure out what was going on wrong with your program. And what do debuggers let you do? Well, one of the really useful features is it lets you set a breakpoint, right? It says, like, hey, pause the execution of this program at this point so I can go look at the state. And what 
you can do right after you've paused is you can say, okay, continue executing, right? Well, I use the word continue because you know that uh, the rest of that execution that you haven't talked about, that is a continuation. So yeah, so continuations are everywhere, right? They, they're all over the place. And so even though you may not actually explicitly have a construct called a continuation in your language, it is useful to reason about them in a high level way because um, they tell you a lot about how your program works. Okay, any questions about this high level overview? We're gonna go now into the like technical details about like what actually is a continuation. We'll talk about continuation passing style which says how to write your code in a way that the continuations are available, even if your language doesn't support it. And then we'll finally go back to our control flow examples and do them again with continuations. But any, any, any questions about the high level before we go? Okay, let's get rocking. So I want to talk about what a continuation is. And we've already said, hey, continuations are callbacks and callbacks are represented as functions. So uh, really what I'm looking at is I want to extract out the implicit structure in the program and turn it into a, into a function. We'll see what I mean very shortly. So here's a program. Uh, what does it do? It multiplies 2 by x, then it uh, divides uh, 1 by y, and then it multiplies uh, this by 2. So I can write a sequence of sequential instructions saying you know, what the operations I want to do are. And so if I'm currently working on computing uh, the uh, one divided by y, then all the steps that I need to do at some later point in time constitute the continuation, right? They constitute the work that I have yet to do, what I need to do in the future. So all I need to do is somehow represent this as a function. So here is a function that represents the continuation of the computation at one divided by y. So I have some compute that I did before. Um, I've called it before here in this example. So I multiply 2 by x already because I, I'm going to evaluate the plus statement left to right. And then I am currently evaluating uh, 1 divided by y. And what will I do with this result? Right. Once I find out what 1 divided by y, y is, that is some result. And what I'm going to do afterwards is I'm going to you know add it with before and then multiply it by 2. That's what I'm going to do next. So this is the continuation. So given any normal piece of code, I can look at a specific point in the program and ask, hey, what is the continuation? What's going to happen next after I uh, execute this part of this program? And it's a lot easier to do this in an eagerly evaluated language because laziness is kind of crazy. So. So I was able. I said, "Hey, when I write code like that, um, there's this implicit idea that there's a continuation uh, for my code, and there are two ways. Like once you like identify that this, there's this concept in your language, whether or not your language supports it or not, there are two uh, possible routes we can go. One is we can say, well, um, your language should actually let you talk about continuations. They should actually let you say, hey, I'm a, I'm one divided by y. Please like." actually give me the honest to goodness function that represents my continuation so I can do stuff with it. And um, uh, that this feature in your programming language, if it supports it, it's typically called call CC, aka call with current continuation. The other thing I can do is I can say, hey, my language doesn't support this. Can I explicitly reify the continuations um, so that I can like talk about them because they're literal honest to goodness functions? And this is what we call continuation passing style. There is a question in the chat. Isn't this just like composing curried functions? And uh, yeah, I mean. Um, there is a lot of similarity, right? Because I just said, you know, continuations are just functions, and uh, I want to compose functions, so um, why don't I just use function composition? There is a difference, though. So the difference is that um, we looked at this program fragment, and we said, hey, we only care about this fragment, right? So once I'm done, I can just go ahead and return from the continuation. But in a true undelimited uh, context for continuations, 
Um, this doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? There's a whole like, you know, rest of the program that might be printing, might be talking to the user, anything like that. That technically is part of the continuation. So in some sense, a continuation never returns. And uh, so you can't use composition in the normal way because, well, if the function doesn't return, like, you know, you can only compose things at the beginning and not, uh, not the end. But, but we, will, we will see more about this when we talk about continuation passing style. Uh, OK, uh, I have one more example. So here is some code in JavaScript using Node.js. And um, we have, uh, so in Node.js, um, there are a bunch of extra APIs for interacting with stuff like the file system. And these APIs often have a sync and an async version. So the sync version, you literally just say, OK, read out the file. We wait a bit here, and eventually you get out the data, and then you can you know, print it and process it. So there's this implicit notion of the continuation. Uh, Node.js also supports a callbackified version of this function. And what I've done is I just have, well, there's a typo on the slide. Um, I don't need to assign var data here. But what I'm just doing right, is I took this continuation, put it in a function that took data as an argument, and now I just pass that into the function. And the benefit of writing your code in this way is that you now, uh, uh, this is blocking. So literally nothing else will happen while we're waiting for the file to go. But this one, we can continue executing uh, you know, down our program while we are waiting for the file to get written. OK, so let's talk about writing things in continuation passing style. Because Basically, taking code that looks like this and turning it into this is manually creating the continuations, manually creating the callbacks. And this is called uh, writing your code in continuation passing style. And there is a central rule, which we'll see why, uh, which is when you write code in continuation passing style, you never, ever use return. So like, if, if you're writing a program in CPS style and I see a return in it, I know something's gone wrong because you shouldn't be returning. What do you do instead? of returning, right? The idea is that we don't return. Instead, we are given a continuation which says what to do next. And so I will call the continuation with the return result to kick off the rest of the computation, right? I will call this callback with the data representing the result of reading the file, and that is what's going to kick off the rest of this computation. I'm not going to return from read file because um, you know that's not that's not CPS. Let's do some examples. So um, here's some code. So I've got an original program, zero. It's very boring. It just returns zero. And I want to convert it into continuation passing style. So already we can see there's a return statement here. That needs to go how are we going to do it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to change the signature of this function. So instead of uh, not taking any arguments, we now need to take an argument called the current continuation. And what the concurrent continuation says is what I should do next after um, I execute 0. Right? So remember that in traditional procedural abstraction with the stack, we use the stack to figure out where to return to. Now I'm going to use this continuation to tell me where I want to return to. So I'm going to call this with the result of having executed this function. So does anyone want to guess uh, what I do in the body of this function to, to, now that I have this CC function? It's the callback. Yeah, so I'm going to call uh, CC with 0. OK, so let's do a little more complicated example. So here's factorial, my favorite. And uh, we want to convert this to continuation passing style. So uh, the very first thing we need to do when we want to write in continuation passing style is, as I said, the function needs to take the current continuation as an argument so that I know what to do. And then I have a bunch of these return calls. Um, so what I want to do, I want to call the result. Um, sorry, I want to call the continuation with the result in question. So uh, you know, CC1 just like in zero. Uh, in um, in the second call, though, I have a recursive call to factorial. And now I have a problem. So remember, um, 
functions in continuation passing style never return. They only ever call a callback saying what to do with the result. So I can't just say, well, call the current continuation with some expression involving factorial because, well, factorial isn't going to return. So I'm never actually going to get to the current continuation in this situation. So what can I do? Well, remember, don't call me, I'll call you. So what I want to do is re remember that, hey, factorial itself, my recursive call, takes a continuation that says what I want to do after factorial has been is done computing the result of n minus 1. So what does that look like? Well, after I figured out what factorial n minus 1 is, I want to multiply it by n, and then I want to return that value. So I'm going to pass in this callback, which says, OK, multiply r by n, and then call the current continuation. That is to say, the continuation of the current implementation of factorial. And that will give me, um, uh, that will, you know, give me a function that's equivalent to what I had before. Questions about this example? So to recap, if I have a function call that itself takes a continuation, I need to do that transformation. I need to look at what I'm going to do next and turn that into a function that I will pass in to the factorial function in this situation. OK, so here's another example. So uh, this function is called twice. So what does it do? It, uh, like, uh, it takes a function f, and it takes the value x, it calls f on x, and then it calls f on the result again. And I'm going to say that f, when we convert this into continuation passing style, we do take the current continuation, r is an argument to twice. But f, as a higher order function, um, we, we're taking in this function as an argument, f also will take in, require passing in a continuation to say what to do. So what we do is we say, hey, call f with x. And when it returns with a result r, call f on r again. And when that returns, call whatever the you know, continuation for this function would have been uh, for whoever had called twice in the first place. We can see the triangle of doom here, by the way, right? Like the callbacks nesting inside other callbacks again and again. Uh, by the way, um, this code is more directly equivalent to this uh, different version of the original where I like explicitly wrote out the intermediate value. I have to write out all the intermediate values when I CPS. OK, so let me just tell you the rules. right? So the rule is, when I have a function, to CPS transform it, it now needs to take a continuation as an argument. When I previously would have returned, Instead, I need to uh, call the current continuation with a value that I wanted to return. And for all the intermediate computations that happen in my program, and what I need to do is I need to take my program that might have like a lot of arbitrary nesting in the expressions and flatten it into do one thing, assign it to an intermediate result, do another thing, assign it to an intermediate result, and so forth and so forth. Once I've transformed my program in that way, all I need to do is for every given binding, Instead, call the function in question, and then uh, in the callback, do the rest of the translation that I would have done. And if this looks kind of uh, familiar, that's because it is. So do notation in Haskell actually already is converting your code into continuation passing style, right? When I say do x bind e semicolon s, we said that d sugared into um, you know, run e and then bind it with a lambda x that says what to do with the rest of the computation in question. So when I wrote this code, it didn't look like I had any functions. But when I desugar it into explicit bind calls, I can see, hey, actually I've got a function, and this function represents what I should do next after the bind call. So in fact. There is a monad in Haskell called the continuation monad. And it uh, looks like this. Uh, it says, when you return x, uh, so OK, so I need to explain. So the continuation monad um, is uh, a monad where uh, you 
a monadic value takes in a continuation saying what to do next, and then it does some operations with that uh, continuation. So to return a value in the continuation monad, we take in our passing continuation, and then we call that continuation with x, right? saying, hey, this is the result. And then to compose an operation with another operation, well, I take my current continuation as an argument. I call m, passing it another continuation that with that result, I call f with that result and passing cc. So this is like literally the rule I wrote here, but just now in Haskell. And no, the lab is not going to torture you about this, but I think it's pretty cool that um, Haskell like can do this. Questions? What are your questions? Uh, yeah, so this just says what the desugaring is in this situation. Okay. Um, there's a little, uh, I want to take a little detour for a moment and talk about tail call optimization. It is something that we've mentioned in earlier lectures, and now I'm well, well equipped to explain what is going on. So what is tail call optimization? So tail call optimization is an optimization offered by a number of programming languages that says when you make a function call in what is called tail position, uh, we will not allocate a stack frame for that function call. We'll jump directly to it. So in ha Haskell is a language that does support tail call optimization. And it's very important that it supports tail call optimization because it doesn't support loops in a conventional sense. The only way to do loops is to call other functions. So if function calls always created stack entries, then you know you would run any, any decently sized Haskell program would eventually run out of stack space. So what do I mean by tail position? So tail position intuitively is like, uh, you know, the expression doesn't have anything else to do, right? So this g of x call is in tail position because once I'm done uh, evaluating it, I just return the result directly as the result for fx. Whereas this g of x plus 2 is not in tail position because once g returns, I need to then add 2 to it in order to uh, get the final result that I want to return from f. So, um, yeah, so... So when we're thinking about the stack, the way to think about the stack is basically it's um, the stack is a uh, description of the continuation uh, that you want to go to when you return, right? So the uh, the stack the stack frame for G says return to F, but it doesn't say return to the beginning of F. It says return to whatever um, needs to be done afterwards when we uh, um, are done executing G. So when, uh, when there is nothing left to do, the continuation is trivial. It just says, well, go do the next thing. And so tail call optimization says, hey, we can remove the frame in that situation because it isn't actually contributing anything useful to this program. So another way to think about it is if I wrote this code in continuation passing style, let's, let's go through it. I, I f takes the continuation as an argument g is a function that, uh, let's say, takes a continuation. So the continuation in the first branch is just, well, go ahead and pass it on directly to the continuation for f. Whereas the continuation for the second call to g says, well, first you got to add 2 to r, and then you can call the continuation. So tail call optimization just says you don't need to you know, make a new lambda here. You can just pass along cc directly. In the other case, you can't do that, right? Because we need to actually allocate a stack frame saying that, no, 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 you do need to add two to the result before returning. Questions about tail call optimization? We're gonna, we're gonna get through these slides super quick. Ha 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 ha, in that case. Maybe, maybe I'll start on the next lecture if I'm early. Okay. So let's take another look at exceptions. So what do we say about exceptions, right? So with exceptions, we said, hey, um, inside of a try block, uh, I can do some control flow. And um, then there's a cache block, which caches if I throw an exception. And then I go uh, handle the exception inside the exception block. So the current continuation, uh, as we've um, talked about it so far, simply says, hey, um, this is what will happen next. If there, if nothing goes wrong, 
right? If nothing goes wrong, then I will just go ahead and call the current continuation to uh, figure out what the next thing I'm going to do is. But if something does go wrong, I need to do something different. I need to stop executing the current continuation and instead go to a different continuation, namely the catch block handler saying, hey, here's what I should do because now I'm in the error handling case. So there's actually multiple continuations involved when we're dealing with exceptions. There's the success continuation, which says what to do if nothing bad happens. And there's a failure catch continuation, which says what to do if you throw an exception. So let's go back to um, our example, right? So we've got this uh, function f. Uh, we throw an exception, uh, and we call f inside the try, 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 try catch block. And um, there's this dead code console log no, which we'll never get, we'll never get to because we're instead we're going to show the error, and then we're going to go to yes. So let's walk through what. So so like. Based on what you know about exceptions, it's pretty easy to understand what this code does. Let's look at it again under the lens of continuations. So when I do this try statement, I'm saying, hey, uh, I am going to uh, like do some stuff. And um, when the try block catch block is done, um, there's some code I want to run. I want to run console log yes. So at the time of the try statement, this is the current continuation. When I get inside of the program and I'm running this function application, um, the continuation situation is a little more interesting. So I certainly have uh, the current continuation, the success case, that says, well, if f1 successfully returns, then log no and then log yes, right? Because after I log no, I'll exit the try catch block and I'll call yes. So what, what actually happened was this current continuation got composed with uh, the inner, uh, you know, continuation in this uh, try catch block, um, putting them together into one bigger continuation that says what to do after f1. So whoever uh, asked uh, lock, uh, whoever asked, is this like um, composing curved functions? Well, it is. We are we are composing functions um, to put these continuations together. Now the difference here is that there is another continuation, and that's the failure continuation, right? This failure continuation got put into place when we entered the try catch block, and it says if you throw an exception, then uh, go to this catch block and then show error. But notice that the failure continuation is then composed with the success continuation, right? Because after you're done handling the error, if you suppress it, if you don't rethrow it, then you just go ahead and uh, do whatever it was that you were supposed to do after the try catch block. So when I um, actually get to the inside of this function and I throw an exception, there is some continu current continuation which says, you know, go to the console log no and then go to con console log yes. But throw says, when I'm in the continuation world, ignore the current continuation, the success continuation, and instead call the failure continuation uh, to um, actually do the processing in this situation. And once we get here, uh, we're in the catch statement, and uh, we no longer have the failure continuation that we had installed previously, and we have a success continuation that says we're just going to go ahead and log the rest of this program. So, in fact, the failure continuation is whatever it was in the ambient context. So, if there's like some you know enclosing try catch block that I haven't put in this example, that's the one we would use in this case. Questions. The question, could we uh, desugar try catch into continuation passing cell? The answer is yes, and you are going to do that in the next lab. Let's look at another uh, language feature called finally. Um, so finally is a very interesting language construct. Uh, finally says, um, no matter what happens, uh, always execute me and then continue doing whatever it was you were doing. So here's a very interesting program. So it says try, catch, finally. Um, the try block throws, and the catch block throws as well. 
And what we're expecting to happen is we will still log B even though the cache blocked through. So finally is useful because it may do some cleanup that you need to do even in the error case, right? If we had just put console log B after the try cache block, it wouldn't have gotten executed when we threw inside of the cache block. So let's talk about what the success and failure continuations are once again when we're executing this program. So when we enter the try block, there's some ambient failure continuation and some ambient current continuation, and I haven't told you what either of these are. When I execute throw, uh, there is a, um, well, there's a bunch of stuff, right? So there was a current continuation which said if this was not a throw and this was just a normal operation that would have passed, I was, was supposed to, you know, uh, then go to the finally block and then do whatever it was the um, current continuation was. The failure continuation was installed by the try catch just like in the previous example. And uh, what I want to do is I just want to go and execute the catch in this situation. Uh, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elaborate exactly what happens next in the situation. So we threw in this case. So the current continuation goes away. And we're going to start executing the failure continuation. So inside the failure continuation, uh, once again, there are two possibilities. So one is if we didn't actually throw one here and uh, we just returned a normal result, well, in this situation, we would have then done the finally block because that's what we expect to do, and then gone off and done whatever the current continuation had been on entry to the try catch block. If we throw in the catch block, as is the case here, something a little different happens. So we still execute the finally block because, as I said, the semantics of finally is we always, always, always execute it on exit from here, no matter what the failure case is. But then, instead of going off and doing the success continuation, we go back and do whatever the ambient failure continuation would have been in that context. And that's the path that actually gets taken in this example. Questions about this example? There's a question which is, how would one implement typed exceptions? That's a great question. Uh, so one way to do it um, that would work in our metacircular evaluator is we would have um, a number. Uh, how would I do this? I'm not sure actually. So one very crappy way to do it is just to um, like always catch it and test if uh, the exception matches the type and if it doesn't pass it along to the next catch handler. You could certainly do it that way. Um, it's not very efficient though uh, so you might like want to like come up with some scheme where I can go directly to the um, catch handler that knows how to uh, handle this particular type of exception. But now, th upon reflection, I'm guessing um, I'm guessing most implementations just go through the catch handlers because it's not so easy to figure out uh, what the most uh, the the recent the applicable and most recent catch handler for a given exception is. Well, I mean, if you're in C++, C++ is like, yo, I don't care how slow exceptions are. They can be as slow as I want. And then they like, you know, they don't care. Um, so it's not a problem if they implement it in a bad way. Uh, oh, I, I didn't finish my example. So to finish off the example, we go to the finally block. And something very interesting to point out here, the current continuation in the finally block is to the what we were calling the failure continuation at the top level try catch block, right? So, so even though this is the failure continuation inside of the finally context, it's the current continuation. And in fact, if I threw an exception, that would also go to the failure continuation from the ambient context. So to summarize it all up, right? Like we have all these continuations and like these lines of code would, if they succeeded, have gone this way to the success continuation, whereas the failure cases jump to the cache block and then jump to the uh, original failure continuation in those situations. Any more questions? Uh, so, okay. So there's one more thing I want to point out, which is that Continuations 
are a form of generalized go-to. So if you're used to being able to um, like write go-to in the C language, there's just one extra thing that continuations add on top of it, which is that they are functions. So they can also be associated with state. So a go-to in C is just literally go to this line in the program and there's no like sort of state associated with it. You just, you have to be within the same function and you just preserve whatever the intermediate value, uh, the, the variables inside this function's values are um, at the time you did the go-to. Continuations, you're just doing a function jump. So like, you know, world's your oyster, right? You can, you can have whatever state you want in a continuation in a situation. This is also, by the way, why people don't like using continuations because they are very, like, they have exactly the same problem where you can end up in a spaghetti situation that uh, the original GoTo did and why, you know, Dijkstra was like, hey, you know, please don't use GoTo if you don't need to. All right. Um, so... There are a bunch of other examples. Um, we might do some of them because I do have some time left, but just to go over them briefly. Uh, so we've done all this stuff, basically remodeling exceptions using continuations, but there's a ton of other interesting language features that we can do with continuations. So I've already mentioned uh, in languages that have uh, native continuation support, there is a function called call cc which gives you the current continuation, like, like reifies it out of thin air into a function that you can call at some later point in time. So like that's, that's like sort of the mother of all uh, functions. You can basically implement anything you want using call CC. But there's some other more restricted cases that languages have often added as first class uh, uh, constructs that you can actually work with in the language. One of these is what we call non-deterministic choice. So what is non-deterministic choice? So non-deterministic choice says, hey, um, let's imagine that uh, I'm um, writing a program and I want to flip a coin. And if the coin turns up heads, I want to do something else. And if the coin comes up uh, false, I want to do a different branch. Now, in a normal programming language, you would have to commit to one choice, and then you would have to go down the program that way, and that would be it. You wouldn't, like, you chosen and the chosen uh, the choice is irrevocable if you want to like resample it at a different value you'd have to run your entire program again in a language with continuations you don't have to worry about that you can say hey uh, i'm going to try this path for now but i'm going to save the continuation co corresponding to having done the other choice and if i decide oh actually i don't like this universe like um my my sat uh problem is unsatisfiable in this branch i can then you know, back jump to this uh, choice and then decide to do a different choice in the situation uh, using my continuation, right? Because the continuation says what I would have done next if I had uh, continued down this other path. In Python, there's a language feature called generators. What are generators? Generators are a way of, you know, we talked about them in the lazy evaluation lecture. They're a way of saying, okay, suspend the computation here and then wait until um, the external person using the iterator asks for the next element to keep going. Well, if you have continuations, the suspension of the function that, you know, has the yield is simply whatever the current continuation at the point of the yield is. And um, generators can be generalized into coroutines where um, coroutines just implement that cooperative concurrency I was talking about, where you have one program that executes a bit and then says, okay, I'm done for now. Uh, please run this other code uh, for a bit so that um, uh, it can make some progress before calling back to me. And when they suspend themselves and then transfer execution to the coroutine, the other routine that is working with it, um, that suspension, once again, is just the continuation. So you just stash the continuation somewhere, and then later when you want to pick up and resume, you just call the continuation to get there. And we will do this in the concurrency lab, which is not, not next week, but in a little bit. All right, so to summarize, um, we talked about GoTo at the very beginning, right? At the very beginning, there was only hardware. The hardware only knew how to jump to arbitrary locations in uh, your uh, bytecode execution stream. And um, people were like, hey, you know, GoTo is kind of naughty. 
So uh, let's put a little bit more structure on it. So that gave us block control flow. It gave us if statements, gave us while loops, it gave us you know for loops. But that wasn't enough, right? Um, we wanted a way of saying, hey, sometimes I want uh, my program execution to diverge based on some data. And then based on the data, I can do something dynamically. And so that was examples of procedural abstraction and exemptions. And subsuming all of this are continuations, which let us implement everything that you could possibly want to do in the situation. Uh, so yeah, so continuations let us witness the duality between values in our program, which represent the past, right? Whenever I have a value in my program, it corresponds to some computation that had happened in the past. So values are just that, right? I don't have to do the compute anymore. I've got it. And the continuation is a reification of the future. It says what I'm going to do next. And when we talk about explicit continuations, that also lets us hold these as values in our hand so we can treat them just like we do the past. And uh, that's all of my prepared slides. OK, so there's a question in the chat, which is, does async await essentially split functions into the first part and another part that becomes a continuation or possibly multiple continuations? Uh, and the answer is yes. And sometimes literally, like, like um, to compile async await in Haskell, uh, you don't need async await. You just use monads, and you do the continuation monad, and it's literally, literally split up this way. And in uh, some other languages, um, uh, often it is uh, like async await basically just gives you the ability to, to jump into the middle of a bytecode stream. Um, so you may not actually have split it, but there is a way to like get into the middle, and so that's effectively equivalent to having split it. Great question. Other questions? Any requests for what I should do with this leftover eight minutes and early is also an option. Uh, there's another question, which is what languages have call CC support? Um, so uh, call CC is um, is originally from the Lisp tradition. So um, if you are in a Lispy language like Lisp or Scheme or Racket, chances are it supports call CC. Um, in many programming languages, it's pretty difficult to support continuations because it's kind of crazy, right? What, what, what continuations are saying is it's like, hey, like, yo, um, you've got some virtual machine that's executing, and I need you to like somehow take that and reify it into an object so that I can start executing it at some later point in time. But even worse, I need you to be able to start executing that at some later point in time, even if you started like if you continued like executing it and um, you actually finished up all of the computation there, and then you but I, I stashed that continuation somewhere, and then later in a completely unrelated part of the program, I say, hey, uh, I want to go back. I, I want to go back to the old days and um, and uh, see what's going on there. Um, there is also a very interesting new development. So, so call CC is what we call undelimited continuations, but there is also another form of continuations called delimited continuations. And so um, where undelimited just says the continuation refers to everything else that can possibly happen in the program, a delimited continuation refers to, a, we set a boundary. We say, well, we want to know what will happen up until this point. And then once you get to that point, you can just return the value. And so delimited continuations are a lot better behaved because they like don't capture everything. They only capture up to some point. And then um, like once you get to that point, you just return back to the normal execution of your code. And there's even more recent development called algebraic effects, which is basically a structured form of delimited continuations. And they're pretty cool, and I can't really explain what they are 
uh, here, but the, but they're very nifty and they're a more they're, they're like not as bad as um, continuations, which can get really unruly because they're basically go tos. Um, I see a request for live coding, but uh, there's more questions, and I'm not sure how much live coding I can actually do, so I'm just going to keep answering questions. Uh, so there's another question about call CC. Um, how does it handle multiple continuations with the try catch stuff, for example? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, let me think. How do I want to answer this? So, okay. So all call CC does is it tells is it gives you a function that says what you would have done um, if you continued executing your program normally. So if you want to model exceptions in a language that supports call CC. Uh, you still kind of have to do it the um, normal way, which is when you want to install an exception handler, you have to, um... well, let me think. Okay, uh, maybe I can, can I live this code this? Uh, no, I can't live code this, but I'll, I'll write some text. Oops. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. So the situation that we're looking at here is um, I, I want to write a try catch block, right? So I've got some random function. I don't know what it is. And I've got some accept block. I've got some other random function, and I don't know what it is. So how can I do this with call CC? So when I, when I do call CC, I'll call CC is a function. So it actually takes in a function as an argument, basically saying, hey, here is the current continuation at this point in time. Okay. Then what I want to do is I just want to go ahead and call f, but I also want to give it a failure continuation, which says, if you're raising an error, please go ahead and call G and then call the current continuation at this point. Um, and then um, F can, it can just return normally in this case, but you could also like call CC on that. And this would be an implementation of exceptions. So you still have to pass in the exception handler uh, as an explicit argument to the function, but that's all you have to do. All right, anything else? I'm just going to end early in that case. All right, thanks everyone for coming. See you next week. Yes, I will.